Hello everyone and welcome to the last official lab of STATS 250 for this semester. Um, so this lab we are concerning ourselves with different types of chi-square tests. Um, so some reminders before we get started. Um, we have a, a few more pieces of work that we have to finish up. Um, so we have to complete the Lab 13 wrap-up quiz, um, Homework 10, and Pre-Lab 12. These are the last official works that we need to turn in before the final exam, and they'll all be due on April 17th. Um, so make sure you get those in. Um, also, there's a chance for extra credit um, if you complete a post-survey for MWrite. That'll be due on the 22nd of April. Um, and what else? Um, so concerning more with Pre-Lab 12, you might notice that Pre-Lab 12 is more of that creative reflection. Um, you might have noticed that there's some chance for extra credit on that as well. Um, to get that extra credit, you have to go above and beyond, rather than just like writing a short summary of one of the topics. Um, so if you just want to write a short summary, you can just get your regular pre-lab credit, but if you actually put the creative in creative reflections, such as converting some song lyrics, um, drawing a picture, pretty much anything that puts the creative in creative reflection will get you those two extra credit points. Um, and as we were talking about, pretty soon the final exam is coming up. You should get some info on that coming up soon within one of our announcements. Um, so going over some extra review material concerning that. Um, if you want to check out Supplement 2, remember last week we were talking about linear regression. Supplement 2 is a really good resource to see a full-on linear regression type problem that walks through all the steps. So that's a real good resource. As well as um, going through Worksheet 2, so this concerns all of the types of tests that we've gone through in this class and all the assumptions for each of the tests. So make sure you work through that and then once you're done the solutions will be available under review info so you can check your work on that. Alright so let's do a little bit of review. So talking about chi-square tests we can see where these fit in. So again we'll be working with categorical type data such as we were before with our one and two population proportion type tests. So there are three different types of chi-square tests that we will discuss. Um, the first one is called goodness of fit. So basically what this does is helps us assess if a particular discrete model is a good fitting model for a discrete characteristic based on whatever random sample we're working with. So basically we have this like null distribution of these particular proportions and we want to see if within the sample that we drew, if those observed proportions match what was defined in that null distribution. Um, so a couple examples of what this goodness of fit test might look like. So this first example, do M&Ms actually have the following distribution of colors as stated by Mars Candy? One random sample of M&Ms are collected and the total colors are counted. So this distribution is our particular null distribution we're working with, such as the number or the proportion of blue M&Ms is 24% or 0.24. The proportion of orange is 0.2, the proportion of green 0.16, proportion of other is 0.4. Basically, we want to draw a sample and see if we are kind of similar to this null distribution. Um, so looking at this, we were working with that one population of M&Ms and one categorical variable of the proportion of colors. Um, then we're also looking at the second example. Three popular burrito joints on campus are BTB, Chipotle, and Pancheros. A large random sample of Michigan students are asked which of the three locations they prefer the most. Are the three burrito joints preferred equally often for the population of Michigan students? So again, we're looking at that one population of Michigan students and one categorical variable of whatever their preferred burrito joint is, whatever proportion prefers BTB or Chipotle or Pancheros, and we want to see if that matches our null distribution of equal preference. So our next type of test we'll talk about is the test of independence. So this helps us assess if two discrete or categorical variables are independent for one single population. So basically the main question we're trying to answer is if there is a relationship between two variables, again for that one single population. So for one, th one thing to note about independence type tests is that we're always working with that one population and looking at two different variables and seeing the relationship between those two variables. 
Um, so again, a couple examples for an independence test, what that would look like. Our first example, is there an association between living situation, dorm off campus, etc., and class standing, freshman, sophomore, etc., for UM students. Um, a large random sample of UM students are asked whether they where they live and what their class standing is. So you see in this example, we have our one population again of U of M students, and then we have our two categorical variables, living situation and class standing. Um, so let's take a look at the second example. So is there a relationship between gender and chocolate pref preferences, um, white milk, dark, etc.? So for stats 250 students, one large random sample of stats 250 students are polled, and their gender and chocolate preference is recorded. So again, we're working with that one population of stats 250 students, and we're working with two categorical variables. One is gender, and one is whatever their chocolate preference is. So we want to see if those two variables are in any way associated with one another. And our third and final type test that we will discuss is test of homogeneity. So for this, we say it helps us assess if two or more populations are homogeneous with respect to the distribution of some discrete variable. So if you remember back from test of independence, we were discussing one population and two variables. But now for homogeneity with respect to those two things, we're kind of um, flipping that. So instead of one population, we're concerning with two or more populations, and we want to see if they have the same distribution for one certain categorical variable. Now, so let's see a couple examples of what this might look like. First example, a survey asked a large random sample of children and an independent large random sample of adults, which ice cream flavor was their favorite? Is the distribution of ice cream preference the same for all children and adults? So you see with this prompt we're given, we have our two different populations of children and adults. And we have one variable of interest, which is their ice cream preference. And we want to see if these ice cream preferences are the same between our two populations. Right. So let's look at the second example. A Midwesterner wants to determine if the distribution of adults that know how to play the card game Euchre differs from various states. Six large random independent samples of adults were taken in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the adults were asked whether or not they knew how to play the card game Euchre. So here, um, as we said, for a test of homogeneity, it could be two or more populations. In this case, we're looking at six different populations um, for each of the states that were mentioned, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin. And then we're looking at that one categorical variable of a proportion of people who know how to play Euchre. And we want to see if that distribution between each of those states is the same of people that can play Euchre or not. So let's delve a little deeper into these two types of tests, homogeneity versus independence. So as, if you might have noticed when you were talking about them that they kind of seem a little bit like the same thing. Um, so they are very similar tests, and that's why if you notice looking at your formula card, um, for between the three tests, how we calculate our expected counts and degrees of freedom. Between these two tests, um, those things are actually calculated in the same way. Um, so since they are pretty similar, what's the difference between them? Pretty much the biggest difference is how the data ends up being collected. So basically, um, if we were to um, just take one particular sample of data and record two different variables, um, we're looking at that test of independence. And if we take multiple samples and record one variable, then we've got homogeneity. So basically, it's whatever question we're trying to answer, like what we're actually interested in learning about. Are we interested in learning about differences in variables? That would be an independence test. But if instead, are we interested in learning about differences or similarities between populations, that's more of a test of homogeneity. Uh, so let's think about these two similar scenarios. So for the first one, we take a random sample of wedding guests and record if they were from the bride's side or the groom's side and what type of meal they requested. In this particular instance, we would say that this would be an independence type test because we have one population and two variables, that one population of wedding guests and the two variables of bride or groom's side and type of meal they requested. 
But then let's take a look at the second prompt. We have a random sample of wedding guests from the bride's side, and a second random sample from the groom's side, and record what type of meal they requested. So you see here, this is a really similar prompt, but in this case, instead of bride and groom side being considered a variable, um, it's actually pretty much differentiating our two different populations. So in this case, we have two different populations. Our first population, wedding guests from bride side, second population, wedding guests from groom side. And then the one variable we're interested in learning about is that type of meal they requested. So again, it's pretty much this difference of however many populations we're looking at is our main difference between these two types of tests. Um, so some other general key hints. Um, so homogeneity, we usually reference distributions and discuss if they're equal. And independence um, usually uses terms like association, dependence, or relationship. So basically, when we're looking at the prompt of whatever question we're looking at, these are some good keywords to look out for to know what type of test we're looking at. So these are different types of hypothesis tests that we've talked about before, but they are still hypothesis tests. So we have our four steps that we need to follow. So remember, first setting up our hypotheses. Next, we state and check our assumptions. Next, we calculate our test statistic and p-values. And then after that, we report conclusions and make decisions. Um, so let's see how this process looks for each of our types of tests. So going through step one, determining our hypotheses, looking for our goodness of fit. Um, so in general, um, for our chi-squared test, whenever we set our hypotheses, um, we only need to set the null hypothesis. And the reason we do that is because the alternative hypothesis is always just the opposite. So it's kind of redundant to write it. So instead, we'll just write the null hypothesis. So in general, for goodness of fit, our null hypothesis is each of our proportions are equal to some certain value. Um, so looking back at our examples that we talked about before, so if you remember our example one for the distribution of M&M colors, um, what we want to see for a null distribution is if those proportions were equal to that null distribution, so that proportion of blue M&Ms is indeed 0.24, proportion of orange, 0.2, green, 0.16, and other 0.4. So that's our null hypothesis for that first example. And for our second example, um, we were talking about burrito joints, and we were interested in seeing if the proportion of whoever liked whoever, whatever um, burrito joints was the same. So for our three burrito joints, we want to see those proportions of preference to be equal. And since there's three of them, they should each equal about 0.33. So next for our test of independence, how our hypotheses will look. Um, so our null hypothesis in general for independence would be that there is no association between our two variables for whatever population we're working with. So looking back at our examples, so our first example of the living situation in class standing, so our null hypothesis would be that there is no association between those two variables, living situation, and class standing for the population of UN students. And then our second example about ice cream, or chocolate preferences, I mean, um, our null hypothesis would be that there's no relationship between gender and chocolate preferences for the population of STATS 250 students. Right now, looking at our test of homogeneity, our null hypothesis in general for these types of tests are that the distribution for our categorical variable is the same for however many populations are we are looking at. Um, so going back to our examples for these, our, for our first example, we would say the distribution of ice cream preferences is the same for our two populations, which were our population of children and adults. Then our second example, we were talking about the Euchre game for different states. So our null hypothesis would be that the distribution of adults that know how to play Euchre is the same for the states of Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. All right, so now we can look at the second step of our hypothesis test, which is stating our assumptions. Um, so between the three of these types of tests, um, for all of, of these three tests, we have two assumptions that are the same throughout all three. Um, so that's that at least 80% of the expected counts are greater than five and none of the expected counts are less than one. 
And then there are a couple other assumptions more specific to certain types of tests. So for goodness of fit or test of independence, we have one more assumption that the responses are random sample for the population of interest. And then just for test of homogeneity, we have two assumptions for that, which is each sample of responses is a random sample for a corresponding population of interest. And since we're looking at different populations, we want to see um, that each of those samples from each of those populations are independent from one another. So talking about stating our assumptions, now we can talk about how we would check. So for all of our tests, um, we mainly need to check for those assumptions that are the same for all of them, that at least 80% of expected counts are greater than 5, and none of them are less than 1. So the way to check for these, um, so these are in our formula card, how to check our expected counts. So for goodness of fit, um, the way we find our expected count would be just taking our sample size n and multiplying it by our null proportion. And then for our test of homogeneity um, and for test of independence for both of them, how I find our expected counts is that usually with these type of tests where you're given our data within a table type format. And once we have our table, we have our numbers of rows and columns. So the way that we do that is that we take our number of rows and multiply that by our number of columns and divide that by our total size n. So now we can take a look at our third step, which is calculating our test statistic. Um, so this is a formula that we use by hand to calculate our chi-squared test statistic. So it would be the sum of all of our um, observed minus expected counts, um, each of them squared, um, divided by the expected. So when it says the sum, so um, before, as we were saying, we'll be working with like multiple variables or multiple populations. So you just need to take this fraction for each of the variables or populations of interest and then just add them all up. So for our goodness of fit, whenever we're working with our chi-squared, our goodness of fit degrees of freedom is just found by doing our k, which is our number of groups minus 1. And then for our test of independence and homogeneity, how we find our degrees of freedom. Again, since we're working with our table format, we have our numbers of rows and columns. So we take our numbers of rows minus 1 and multiply that by our number of columns minus 1. So that's how we find our degrees of freedom for both of those types of tests. Um, so now that we're talking about our chi-squared test statistic, we should talk about the distribution that it follows. Um, so the chi-squared test statistic follows our chi-squared distribution. So this is a strictly positive distribution. So as you see within this particular graph, you can draw out the chi-squared just as it is right here. So since it's positive, it starts at zero and goes upward. Um, and it's pretty much right skewed, as you can tell. And so Pretty much whenever you're drawing out these chi-square distributions, you don't need to be too precise with them. Just make sure that it looks pretty right skewed and that it's positive, meaning it starts at zero and goes up. Um, so whenever um, we draw out these distributions and we want to draw out our p-value, we always want to shade to the right of our observed test statistic. So again, since this is a strictly positive distribution, um, there's not really any difference um, between like whatever side, um, two side, one side test and whatever particular side we need to look at. So thinking back to like our um, Z testing and T testing and those distributions, how they were like symmetric and you could be looking at the left side or the right side of those distributions. It's easier with chi-squared since it's positive, we're only concerned with one particular side. So we don't need to think about what side we're looking at. It's always to the right of our test statistic. There's no direction in the alternative hypothesis. Um, so how we find our mean and standard deviation? So the mean of our chi-square distribution is simply just our degrees of freedom. And then our standard deviation is found by taking the square root of 2 times the degree, degrees of freedom. So this would be how you find either of these parameters. So now that we have our test statistic, we can talk about how we would find our p-value. So if you remember back at the, when we were working with our t-test statistic and how we would find a p-value from that, given our certain table, that we need to find a certain range of numbers instead of one particular number. It's the same thing with chi-squared, because given our certain chi-squared table, whenever we find our test statistic, it might not exactly be in the table, 
So again, what we need to do is, given whatever degrees of freedom, we need to find whatever our test statistic is, we need to find what two numbers lie around that particular number. And then from there, we could find our certain p-value range. Now we can take a look at the fourth and final step of our hypothesis test, which is reporting our conclusions. So for this, we'll just take a look at each of our examples and see how we would write out the conclusions for each of them. So for our two examples for our goodness of fit, so our first one about M&M &M colors, we could say that there either is or is not sufficient evidence against the claim that the population distribution of M&M &M colors is different from the distribution specified in the null hypothesis. And then for a second example, there is or is not sufficient evidence against the claim that the three burrito joints are preferred equally often for the population of all UM students. So you might notice here that when we write out these conclusions, um, since when we wrote out our hypotheses, we only wrote them out in terms of the null, Whenever we write out the conclusions, we could pretty much write those out in terms of the null as well. And we could just write, is or is not sufficient evidence against the null hypothesis. So before you might have remembered that usually we would write out these conclusions, there is or is not sufficient evidence for the alternative. But since we're not really writing out what the alternative is in this case, we're only given the null, we can just write it out as saying, is or is not sufficient evidence against the null. That's a little, a little aside. Um, so let's take a look at the test of independence and how our conclusions might look for that. So we could say there is or is not sufficient evidence to suggest that there is a significant association between living situation and class standing for the population of UM students represented by this sample. And then for our second example, there is or is not sufficient evidence to suggest that there is a significant relationship between gender and chocolate preference for the population of STATS 250 students. So again, remembering what our variables are, what our population is, stating them in context within the conclusion. And then for our last test of homogeneity, um, we could say there is or is not sufficient evidence against the claim that the distribution of ice cream preference is the same for the population of all adults and all children. Then for the second example, there is or is not sufficient evidence against the claim that the distribution of adults that know how to play euchre is the same for our six states, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. All right, so now that we've talked about the differences between all these types of tests, let's um, look through a few different prompts and see if we can figure out what types of tests that we should be running given these prompts. So for the first one, we say to test a theory that people have no preference among four different outdoor activities, you ask a large random sample of 100 people to select their favorite outdoor activity from a list of jogging, bicycling, hiking, and swimming. So given this prompt, do you think that it is a test of independence, homogeneity, or goodness of fit? Pause the video, think about it for a little bit. When you're ready, click play. So for this one, we would say that this is a goodness of fit type test. So um, the main thing that we should be looking for in naming the type of test we're working with is however many populations and however many variables we're working with. So in this case, we have our one population, our one sample um, of 100 people, and then we have our one categorical variable of outdoor activity. So in this case, we have one population, one variable, that falls in within our goodness of fit type test. So let's take a look at this prompt. A researcher wants to determine if artistic ability depends on being handedness, so whatever type of hand you work with. Um, so the researcher takes one random sample of individuals and records whether they are right or left handed and records whether they scored high or low on an artistic ability test. So given this prompt, what is our appropriate chi-squared? Test. So in this case, we'd say that this is an independent type test. So again, um, looking at our population, we have our one population or one certain random sample of individuals. And then we have our two different variables, which would be our first variable, whether they're right, right or left handed, our second variable, whether they're on um, score higher or low on that artistic ability test.
Um, and then after these, we can also remember looking at our certain keywords within our prompt. So artistic, we want to see if artistic ability depends on whatever handedness. So if we want to see if this one variable depends on the other. So independence. Now for this prompt, a national organization wants to compare the distribution of highest level of education completed for Republicans and Democrats. A random sample of Republicans and an independent random sample of Democrats is taken. So what is our appropriate chi-square test for this? So in this case, this would be a test of homogeneity. Um, so here we have our two different populations, um, one Republican, one Democrat, and we have working with one variable of their highest level of education completed. Um, and then again, we can take a look at the keyword for homogeneity. Um, we're looking at um, the distributions of these populations and comparing them. So let's take a look at one more prompt. Um, a preservation society has the percentages of five main types of fish in a river from 10 years ago. After noticing a recent imbalance, they add some fish from hatcheries to the river. They wish to assess if the ecosystem is restored to the distribution from 10 years ago. What is our appropriate test? So this we would say that it is a goodness of fit type test. Again, we're looking at our one population and one categorical variable. Um, but probably the most telling thing about this prompt is that we want to see if our ecosystem is restored to the distribution from 10 years ago. So basically, we're taking a look at these different distributions, and we want to see if our particular distribution now matches our null distribution, which is the one from 10 years ago. So setting that as our null, we want to see if those distribution of proportions matches that particular null distribution. So that would be our tell that we're looking at our goodness of fit test. All right, so let's go over the review by example. So this will be on page 96 of your lab workbook under lab 13. Um, so we'll go over the prompt. So a marketing director of a nursery that sells English rose plants wants to assess if there is a relationship between the color preference and the fragrance preference among customers. The manager recorded color fragrance combinations for 2,000 randomly selected searchers. So based on these results, estimate the probability of the event. A customer searches for a red rose and a customer searches for a rose with a tea rose fragrance. So when doing this, note that our chi-squared problems are a great spot to add in old probability questions. So as a little note of how you might want to answer this question, think back to our probability type rules. Um, so for this, um, since we want to find the probability of these occurring at the same time, that would be their intersection, right? So if remembering our probability rules, the probability of two events occurring at the same time, their probability of A and B, that would be our intersection. So in this case, our A event would be red rose, and our B event would be rose with a T rose fragrance. So we can find out what that intersection is. When we're looking at our table, we can just look to see where our row and columns intersect. So red rows column, T rows row, and that'll give us a total count of 130 that fall within that intersection. So in finding that probability, we'll take that 130 over the total N of 2,000, and that'll give us a probability of 6.5%. So let's move on to this question. So what would be the appropriate chi-square test for assessing whether there is a significant relationship between the color preference and the fragrance preference in the population of all potential customers? So think about it for a second. So for this one, we'd be working with our test of independence. So here we're looking at our one particular population and two categorical variables, those two variables being color preference and fragrance preference, and we want to see if there's a relationship between those two variables specifically. So let's take a look at the next question. So assuming the variables color preference and fragrance preference are independent, 
for the population of all potential customers, what is the expected number of searches for a white rose with a myrrh scent? So for this, um, since we want to find the expected number, that should be um, our looking at our formula for expected counts. The first thing we have to remember the formula, um, how we would find those expected counts. So remember that they're a little different between the type of, of tests that we run. So for a test of independence, our expected counts would equal. Um, so remember within our independence test, we're given that table format. So we would take our row total times our column total, divide that whole thing over our total total. So in this case, our row total, looking at our fragrances, looking specifically at myrrh, we could see the total for that row is 440. And then looking at our columns, specifically white rows, the total for that column is 500. So we would do 440 times 500 over the total of 2,000, and then that would give us an expected count of 110. So let's take a look at our next question now. So the observed test statistic is 40.5093. Calculate the contribution to the test statistic from the searches for white rows with MER scent. So if we remember how we calculate our test statistic for our chi-squared, remember we take um, all of our observed minus our expected counts squared over our expected. So remember that we're um, summing all of these that we do for each of our contributions. So when we're, whenever we're um, asked for a problem, so to calculate this particular contribution, so in this case, this particular contribution for white rose and MERS scent, we just have to work with this formula once. We don't have to worry about summing up a bunch of different ones. So in this case, um, talking about chi-squared specific to white rose MERS scent, we would take our observed counts for these for this intersection and subtract from that our expected count that we just found in the previous problem. So if we look at the table, we could get an, an observed count for white rows and MERS scent in the table. So where they intersect the, the row and column, that was given to be 92. So I'll put that within our observed. And then for our expected count was what we just calculated as 110. So plugging these two numbers, we can get the contribution for specifically white rose and MERS scent to be 2.9455. So now let's take a look at this next question. So determine the degrees of freedom and find the p-value bounds. And then we'll also use this to complete our conclusion for this test. So again, looking at our independence test, we'll take a look at that formula card to see specifically how we find our degree of freedom. So for this, we would take our rows minus 1 and multiply that by our number of columns minus 1. So in this case, um, within our table, we see we have 5 rows and 6 columns. So for our degrees of freedom, we'll do 5 minus 1, which is 4. Multiply that by 6 minus 1, which is 5. So 4 times 5 gets us 20 degrees of freedom. Once we have our degrees of freedom, then we can go ahead and go to our chi-squared table and look specifically at that row for our 20 degree of freedom. And then we want to find where our observed test statistics. So remember, earlier on, we were given that our whole observed test statistic was 40.5093. We want to see specifically where this falls within our row of our 20 degree of freedom. So if we notice here that it falls in between Within this row, it falls in between these two numbers, 39.9 and 45.3. So seeing that, then we can scroll up back up to the top of the table to get our certain p-value bounds. So in this case, we can see that our range of p-values would be in between 0 0.001 and 0 0.005. Now that we have our p-value bounds, we can go ahead and write our conclusion. We would say, at a 5% significance level, there is sufficient evidence to suggest that there is a significant relationship between the color preference and the fragrance preference for the population of all potential customers. So in this case, we were able to conclude that there is that relationship. So remember, given that p-value range, we would say that that whole range would fall below that significance level, right? So even though we don't know exactly what that p-value is, we do know for sure it's below our 5% significance. So we can still make that decision 
to reject that null hypothesis and conclude that there is a relationship. All right, so that does it for our review by example. So we can go ahead and get started with the ILP. Um, so there are actually two of them. So make sure that once I'm done giving you the information that you can go ahead and pause the video and complete the two in the project on accidental deaths and eye allergy treatments. Um, so um, you can always circle back to these slides. So they should be posted on the virtual lab resources page. So you can always um, have these up and have them help you out for how to set up um, each of these hypothesis tests and how to work through them. I remember whenever you're working through these, um, if you're getting stuck, remember um, you could always um, meet with your lab instructor off time, so you could always attend one of our live stream labs that we have on our Tuesdays and Wednesdays for help as well. So go ahead and pause the video. We'll, we're, after you're done working on it, we'll go ahead and take a look at a couple solutions for some of the harder problems. So let's take a look at a couple of solutions. Um, so for the first ILP on accidental deaths, um, so how we would write our conclusion within context of the problem. So after working um, and finding that certain p-value, we should be able to come up with the um, decision to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we could say something like, there is not sufficient evidence against the claim that the population distribution of accidental deaths in the particular geographical region, so all the context is different from the distribution specified in the null hypothesis. So since we're working with that goodness of fit type test, we want to see if our certain sample distribution was similar to the null distribution at all. And then in this case, we saw that, that, that there is not sufficient evidence against that claim. Um, so now taking a look at a couple from the next ILP, um, we would say our observed test statistic was calculated to be 12.4179. So complete that following statement. So this statement here, if the distribution is the same for our three populations, then the observed chi-square test statistic is 2.9762 standard deviations above the expected chi-square test statistic. So this is basically um, a an interpretation of our standard score, um, however many standard deviations above or below um, our expected test statistic. So since um, after realizing that this is an interpretation of the standard score, we can just go ahead and plug in the numbers within the formula for standard score. So we put in our observed of 12.4179, and then we plug in our mean of 4 and then our standard deviation. So remember that the mean of our chi-square distribution is just our degrees of freedom, and that our standard deviation is the square root of 2 times that. So our standard deviation is the square root of 2 times 4. After plugging all those in, we should get that standard score of 2.9762. Right. And then after that, we can go ahead and talk about the conclusion at the 1% significance level in context. Again, we should have come up with a decision to fail to reject the null, so we could say there is not sufficient evidence against the claim that the distribution of eye treatment effectiveness is the same for the three treatment populations of new, standard, and placebo. So looking at this homogeneity type test, since we're looking at different populations and how the distribution of that certain variable looked between them. All right, so the last thing that we should look at is the lab ticket for this lab. Um, so once we're gone, done going over the info, you can feel free to pause the video, work on it, and then we'll go over a, a couple select solutions once you're done. So just going over the prompt quickly for this lab ticket, we have a study was performed to examine the attendance pattern and exam performance for students in an intro to statistics course. A sample of 96 students enrolled in the course was selected, and we can also say considered random. So these 96 students were then classified by their attendance stat status, regularly attended lecture or not, and their performance on the midterm exam classified as low, middle, and high. So given that information, we have this certain table that we can take a look at with our data and answer the following questions. 
So pause the video, work on it. When you're done, we can go over a couple of select solutions. So let's take a look at the first question so we know exactly what type of test we need to run. So for that first question, what is the proper chi-square test for assessing if there is a relationship between attendance status and exam performance for the population of students in an intro statistic course? So for this, we'd say that this is a test of independence. So again, looking at um, however many populations and variables we're looking at. So we have our one population of stat students and our two variables, attendance status and exam performance. And again, we can also see within the question that it's specifically asking us for a relationship between the variables. So again, that keyword relationship kind of clues us in as to what test we should run. Relationship between variables, that's an independence type test. Um, we can also take a look at the question for part D. So assume there is no relationship between attendance status and exam performance for all students in an intro to statistics course which value correctly completes the following statement. So this statement, if the study were repeated many times, we would expect 90% of the resulting test statistic values would be less than or equal to blank. So for this, we would say, um, we would fill in, fill in with the number 4.605. And this is um, specifically um, what test statistic that corresponds to the 90th percentile of our chi-squared distribution. Um, so first looking at this first problem, just um, looking at the first part of this problem, assume no relationship between attendance status and exam performance. So this part is basically just saying assume the null is true and that we should use that null distribution given our chi-squared distribution. So now um, knowing that we're working with our chi-squared distribution, first we need to find what our degrees of freedom is. So remember for our test of independence we would take our row column minus one, multiply that by our number of columns minus one. So that should get us a degree of freedom of two. And then from here, um, after knowing this, we have to look up that 90th percentile for a chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom in our chi-squared table. So we would look at the row that corresponds to two degrees of freedom, and then we would look at the column that corresponds to the 90th percentile so remember, whenever we're talking about percentiles, that means that that should be the area to the left of our particular test statistic. And then also remember that with our chi-squared distribution, whenever we're working with our test statistic, it gives us the area to the right um, within the column heading. So knowing that, that means that we should look at the column that corresponds to point 0.1. So that would mean that there's 10% to the right of that certain test statistic meaning the other 90% would be to the left. So 90% to the left, meaning that that is our 90th percentile. So degrees of freedom 2, area to the right 0.1, gives us a chi-squared of 4.605. So that would be that chi-squared that corresponds to our 90th percentile. All right, so that wraps up this lab. Um, and that wraps up our last official lab for this semester, actually. Um, so thank you guys for attending. Thank you guys for a great semester. I know it's been a weird semester, but thank you guys for hanging on this long. Um, so remember the, the stuff we need to turn in by um, April 17th, our main stuff that we need to turn in, the homework and the, um, the pre-lab, as well as that lab wrap-up quiz for this lab 13. Those are all due next Friday, April 17th, so make sure you get those in. Um, and after that, you'll just have to worry about our final exam. So good luck with that, and good luck uh, with everything else. Thank you guys for watching.